Hi Leo Lovelies, in this video the brilliant Dr Webb Burns is going to be looking at nerve structure and impulse conduction for your A-level biology. Now what I want you to do with this video is watch it through slowly, making notes as you're going along, making sure that you understand what bits do what, where, when and then to check that you do understand all of that properly. When you get to the end of the video I want you to jump down to the description, go over to my website and do the quiz on there that will check you've properly understood everything. Okay, so we're going to look at the structure of nerves today and how impulses or electrical impulses or action potentials are conducted down them. So how do they transmit those signals along the body of the cell? And we're also going to look at things that can affect how fast those signals transmit. Okay, so there's three types of neurons that we have to look at. We've got the sensory, the motor and the relay neuron. So the sensory neuron take signals from receptors, so sensory receptors that we've been talking about up until this point, to the central nervous system or the CNS. Okay, so we need to know and label some parts. You might remember some of these from GCSE. So we've got the axon and then we've got the cell body is in the middle of the neuron for the sensory neurons or towards one end. It's sort of off to one side. Uh, the nucleus is obviously in the cell body. And then we have one end that's going to be attached to the sensory receptor. And there's going to be synaptic endings there, so there'll be synapses onto the receptor. There'll also be synapses at the other end onto the central nervous system. So the sensory neurons are taking the electrical impulses from the sensory receptor and then passing them up to the central nervous system. And you'll notice we've got an axon and a dendron here. That's just the type of term we refer to sort of talking about going away from the cell body is the part that carries the impulse away from the cell body is going to be called the axon. Obviously, up until the cell body, the impulse is moving towards the cell body. So then that counts as like a, a dendron or a, an extended dendrite. The axon, it tends to be pretty short because obviously you want to speed up that distance um, of transmitting the impulse from the cell body to the central nervous system. And it just makes that distance quite short and therefore the speed quite quick. OK, so on to the motor neuron. So that is taking impulses from the central nervous system to the effectors. So it still has a cell body, it still has a nucleus in the cell body, but this is just at the end of one, the axon at this point, not just in the middle of the neuron. It's also still going to have synaptic endings at one end and those feathery kind of branches called dendrites at the other end. And the cell body tends to be in the central nervous system. And again, the transmission direction is away from the cell body. So it's from that cell body down towards the synaptic endings. And it's got a long axon, often it's transmitting signals over quite a long distance. And then those synapses at the end are going to synapse onto an effector, which could be a muscle or a gland. Then we lastly have our relay neuron. It connects the sensory and the motor neurons, and it's often located in the spinal cord, so in the CNS itself. It has dendrites, has many short dendrites around its kind of cell body, it's still got the nucleus again in the cell body, and then it has quite a short axon. So um, they're not really traveling very far. Sometimes they can even look kind of almost circular, um, but realistically they're quite a short axon. And they're gonna have the synaptic endings again. And in this one, we've got transmission direction again, away from the cell body to those synaptic endings. So it's gonna go in that direction, similar to the motor neuron. And in this diagram, this motor neuron has myelin sheath around the axon. We're going to talk about what that is in a second. Um, and that's what those orange squares are. And some neurons have it and some don't. And we'll talk about why that is in a bit. But these are the three types of neurons. We should really be able to label them, recognize them, um, and know where they kind of sit in that idea of a reflex arc. So receptor detects a stimulus, sends it down the sensory neuron to the central nervous system, normally the spinal cord, which is the coordinator. In the coordinator, you then have the relay neuron, which connects the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. And then the signal goes down the motor neuron and it goes to an effector. And then that causes a response, whether that effector is a muscle or a gland. Okay, so nerve cells are specialized cells. Hopefully we know that from GCSE. 
So because they're specialised, obviously they look very different from your normal animal cell. Um, they've got lots of adaptations and we're going to look at the myelination as well and what that means. So this is a slightly different picture of a neuron. We can see the cell body in a bit more detail. So we can see our organelles. We've got the nucleus, we've got the SER, the RER, we've got mitochondria, we've got centrioles, we've got um, the Golgi as well, some vesicles, some ribosomes, the cytoplasm, all the usual organelles. But they're obviously going to have some more of some of those because of the role that they carry out. So they have lots of mitochondria and lots of ribosomes. Potentially could say um, a lot of ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum as well, because they do a lot of active transport and movement of ions. So obviously the active transport, the sodium potassium pump needs ATP to be able to carry out that active transport. And we also have a lot of ribosomes in order to make the protein channels in the first place. We need to make the sodium channels, the potassium channels, the sodium potassium pump, they're all made of protein. So we need lots of ribosomes in order to make them. The membrane then is adapted because the cell membrane around the cell body and all along the axon is going to have lots of ion channels as well, more than probably your average cell because of the amount of movement of ions they need to do. And they're very long. So they've got this long, stretched out, thin axon. And obviously they need that to carry impulses over long distances sometimes up to about a metre long, some uh, nerve fibres can be. Okay, so like in the previous slide, this diagram has the myelin sheath on the axon. And so these are special cells or special sections made up of cells, and they actually insulate the axon. So about a third of all peripheral neurons are myelinated. So we say that they're myelinated or their axons are coated in a myelin sheath. Myelin is just made up of layers of a highly lipid rich membrane that is released from these cells called Schwann cells. They, I've got an example at the top, so they kind of wrap around, they produce the myelin and it wraps around, spirals around this axon in layers. And so then we get layers and layers and layers of that membrane built up and it wraps tightly around the axon. And what it does is it actually insulates the membrane. So that means it acts like an electrical insulator. So it stops ions moving across the axon membrane. So there are gaps between these areas of myelin sheath or between these Schwann cells, and they are called the nodes of Ranvier. And that's obviously named after a French person who discovered it. And these gaps are important because it's where action potentials actually occur. Because if the Schwann cells are insulating, that means there's no iron movement where they are covering the axon. So no sodium ions can move in or out, and so therefore we've got no depolarization. So depolarization can only happen at the gaps at the nodes of Ravia where there's a concentration of sodium ion channels. And so that allows the impulse to actually travel quite fast along the neuron. And we'll talk about um, what that is called in a second. But that's one of the important things. So we have these, the myelin sheath, that's what we'd label that. We have the nodes of Ravia, and these are kind of adaptations to increasing the speed of impulses along the neuron. Okay, so hopefully this part of this diagram is going to help you kind of figure out what we mean when we say that an action potential travels along a neuron or travels along an axon or it conducts uh, an impulse along the axon. So in the first diagram here, um, I've got my neuron and we're clearly at resting potential. So more positive outside, less positive or more negative inside and you can see those arrows of representing that the sodium potassium pump is doing its job sodium is being pumped out the potassium is being pumped in and therefore we're maintaining that resting potential of about minus 65. what we need to happen is a stimulus is going to occur at that end with the cell body it's going to be detected it's going to trigger an action potential to happen at that end of the neuron at that end of the axon so that means the sodium channels are going to open the sodium starts to come in. And that impulse, wave of depolarization, we often call it, is going to move to the right along this axon. And that's because once the action potential is finished and we start repolarization, where sodium is being pumped out and potassium um, is leaving through its diffusion gradient, through its um, own ion channels, because the sodium ion channels are closed, no more sodium can leave that's not being pumped out by the sodium potassium pump. And some sodium is gonna be able to diffuse to the right 
along to the next part of the axon because it will diffuse down its concentration gradient along to the next section of membrane where there are sodium ions that are open, sodium ion channels that are open. Some sodium ion channels are going to move down. They're going to make that bit of membrane slightly more positive. That's going to trigger the generator potential, which hopefully will get to the threshold potential. It will open those sodium ion channels. And so sodium will rush in and then we get the next action potential in the next section. And that repeats itself all the way along the neuron until we get to the end. The other reason that it can't move back or go only go in one direction, it can't go back to that section that repolarization is happening, is because we call that section the refractory period. It means that there is a little gap, a little time delay between action potentials, between impulses, and it makes sure that we only travel this one way direction because, as we said, during the refractory period, the sodium ion channels are closed. So that's from the peak of the action potential wave when the sodium ion channel shot at about plus 50, all the way until we get back to resting potential on the graph. And in there, you might see that the little dip below resting potential happens, which is sometimes is called hyperpolarization. And that can happen when too many potassium ions diffuse out during repolarization. Just too many leave, too many positive ions leave. And so we get a little bit more negative inside the cell than resting potential. And so then sometimes those potassium channels are closed to stop any more leaving, to try and let the sodium potassium pump then rebalance it and get us back to resting potential. So that refractory period often goes from about the peak of the wave all the way to where we get back to normal resting potential. That's the refractory period. That's the time in which the sodium ion channels are closed. Only the sodium potassium pump is really working. And then we've obviously got the potassium ion channels normally open all through repolarization. But if it goes too far and too many potassium channels leave, then we get into hyperpolarization and, and those potassium channels then get closed to allow us to get back to being the minus 65 millivolts that we need it to be. So the main thing is to remember that only one action potential at a time can happen. There's a little time delay between them due to the refractory period because the sodium ion channels are shut in that part of the membrane. It forces the action potential to move along to the next part of the membrane where the sodium ion channels can open. And that prevents that action potential from moving backwards and causes it to move one way along the neuron and progress down away from the stimulus. OK, so there are a couple of factors that can affect the speed of this impulse conduction. So how fast these ion movements are going to happen inside the axon and therefore how fast the transmission of the electrical signal is going to be. So myelination we've already mentioned and we said that it was insulating and that's important. So the action potentials can only happen at the nodes of Ranvier in a myelinated neuron. So we have an action potential at where a node is. The ions will have to diffuse through the inside and then another action potential will happen at that node, diffuse across. Another action potential will happen at that node. The ions diffuse across inside, underneath the Schwann cell, and then we get another action potential in each node. So we say that this impulse jumps from node to node. Obviously, there is no jumping of ions on the outside. All it means is if you, as you can see, if you look at that kind of trace, that idea of an action potential, a gap, an action potential, a gap, an action potential, it's, it's got this idea of it moving along and only happening in those spots. This is known as saltatory conduction, and it's very, very fast. So because you're only having to have few action potentials happening at each node, you're not having to have a wave of action potentials moving along every single little piece of the neuron membrane as you go. And therefore that would be a lot slower if you don't have any myelination, if you don't have any of that um, insulating material around the outside. The second is axon diameter. So literally the diameter, how wide is the axon of this neuron? So larger diameters, action potentials travel faster because there's less resistance to the flow of ions in the cytoplasm. They can move more freely and faster. There's less obstacles for them. Whereas in narrower axons, there's more resistance in the cytoplasm. There's sort of less space for them to move through and they can get all bunched up and jumbled up. 
So ions can reach parts of the membrane faster and depolarize them faster and cause a continuous wave of action potentials if you've got a wider axon diameter, which is great and very helpful. Um, so that's one thing that can affect the speed of transmission is how wide the axon is. And then lastly, temperature. And this is the one that makes the most sense. We've learned a lot up until this point about how temperature affects the rates of reaction. And it's basically just about diffusion. Ions are moving in order for this signal to be transmitted. We're relying on diffusion as well as active transport. And those things are gonna happen faster because the ions are going to be able to move faster at higher temperatures because they have more kinetic energy. So that increases the speed. However, same with anything to do with temperature and proteins, if we get to 40 degrees or above, then the protein channels are gonna to start to denature. And we can go into detail about how that happens and talk about how it um, denaturing happens with the structure. And that's obviously gonna decrease the speed of transmission. Okay, so just be careful because it's tempting to kind of go at this question or a question that would be about this in the same way you would do enzymes and all the other things, but just be very clear that you're talking about ions, ion channels, protein channels, and it's they that will be denatured. And if they are denatured, then the control of the ion transport is disrupted. And so we're not gonna be able to have this action potential flow as we normally would. Um, and obviously when you're talking about diffusion, you need to mention the kinetic energy part as well. If you are explaining why temperature affects the rate of impulse conduction or the speed of impulses, same with the denaturing, you might need to explain why it's slower at temperatures above 40 degrees and you need to go into the detail of denaturing, but make sure you focus on the protein channels when you do that. So lastly, thinking about speed, just because I've seen it in a couple of questions and I think it's worth mentioning because it's one of the kind of places where they can bring in some maths, a bit of physics into the biology. So the speed of the conduction or the speed of transmission of the impulses is important. And it can actually be measured. So you can use millivolt meter and some electrodes. They're put very sort of tiny micro electrical electrodes like needles that can be placed into nerve fibers. Some instruments can actually do it on the outside of the skin, sort of placed over a nerve. And with some kind of gel, electro, electrolyte gel, they can kind of send impulses along nerves and measure it from the outside of the skin as well. But they can be done in various kind of exposed nerve fibers that you can get on organisms. And this is sort of how they looked at impulses for the first time in the large giant axons in squid. But the idea is that you can measure the voltage, the potential difference in the membrane. And if you place two electrodes and do it at two points that you know the distance between those two points and you measure the time between action potentials at that point, then you can determine the speed by using distance divided by time. And they've obviously done this and worked out kind of the range of speeds for different neurons. So myelinated neuron is about 100 to 120 meters per second and non-myelinated is about 2 to 20 meters per second. And we're using meters per second here because of our SI units. Um, so obviously few neurons are actually a meter long, but sometimes they are. But most of the time you'll be converting from smaller measurements to meters. But as I said, measure the action potential, the change in potential difference, and measure it between two known points of a known distance, and then you'll be able to work out the speed of transmission. Lastly, why is speed important? And why are some neurons myelinated and some not? Well, sensory neurons, it makes sense for them to be myelinated, and they are often carrying impulses over a long distance. They can be up to a meter, as I said. And so being myelinated means that they can increase their speed of transmission. And that's important because it helps to be able to respond more rapidly to stimuli. So if you are a sensory neuron and you're getting information from receptors around the body, you want to be able to react to those stimuli as quickly as possible, especially really important for reflex actions. So having really fast impulses so that they can get to the coordinator, the CNS quickly, and then a response can be transmitted really quickly is important. And so they're normally myelinated. The ones that are non-myelinated are normally quite short, so their distance is short anyway of the axon, and they normally are used for coordinating subconscious functions. So things that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, which we've mentioned, 
So things like breathing, digestion, uh, those things that are not important that it happens quickly. They are quite slow processes that happen at a regular rhythm or quite slowly. They don't need to be rapid, fast responses. So those neurons are not necessary for them to be myelinated to increase the speed. This is all from potential questions that could come up where they could give you some data that's been taken from neuron measurements like this and ask you to calculate speed. They could then ask you to say which one do you think is myelinated or not myelinated based on the data. They could then ask you about whether or not you think or the reasons why you think those neurons might be a sensory neuron or a autonomic neuron and they could make you explain why based on kind of your knowledge. So that's why I'm kind of going through this bit because I think it's, I've definitely seen it come up in questions before and it's worth thinking about actually kind of remembering that speed equals distance divided by time, making sure we're happy with figuring out how we could measure that um, speed and then thinking about why it's important to have neurons that have fast transmission and ones that don't. Okay, so that's the nervous structure apart from synapses, which we're going to do in a separate video. So the synapse and the uh, how synapses work is the next part of the video. So make sure you watch that. And then once that's done, we are going to move on into muscles and muscle structure as well. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.